Welcome. We have a very special interview today with a very special guest. I would like to introduce you to you, the Hugo Award winner, John Joseph Adams. John, how are you doing? Uh, I'm well. Thanks for having me on. It is such a pleasure. We've been having such fun nerding out, chatting, <laughs> all things world building, writing D&D before the call. And guys, there is more of the same coming today. Let me introduce you to John properly because he is was far too modest to introduce himself. John Joseph Adams has been everywhere and done everything, is the TLDR. He's the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy and more than 30 anthologies such as Wastelands and The Living Dead. He's also an editor and publisher of the Hugo Award winning magazine Lightspeed. And for five years was the editor of the John Joseph Adams Books novel imprint for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And lately, He's joined the dark side. He's been working as an editor on TTRPG products for Cobot Press and Monty Cook and contributing game designer on books such as the Tome of Heroes from our very fine friends over at Cobalt Press. So what's winning right now? Game design, uh, game writing or, or traditional writing? Where, where do your loyalties lie right now on, on the sliding scale of love? Yeah, I mean, the love part is way more towards TTRPGs uh, just because like that's what I probably rather do all the time <laughs> but uh the, but the the practical side is like well i gotta i gotta make a living so i still gotta do this traditional public i mean i still love it all you know but uh it's just that uh you know that's where my heart is leaning these days is toward who's up last with dice guys you heard yes. it here first well of course we will be talking today about rivers and waterways let's kick off with the big one big open question here how can we use rivers in our storytelling? What roles can they take in our stories and what themes can they embody? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, one of the really cool things about uh, different uh, elements like that in, in world building is that you can attach all kinds of mythological or fantastical uh, sort of things to it. Uh, so like, for instance, you know, one commonly known thing is that like, you know, vampires can't cross like uh, running water, that kind of thing. But, you know, there's, you could make anything to do with something like that. You can make any kind of creature that has trouble crossing water, or maybe uh, it's, it's weaker on one side of a river than the other side, or, you know, or anything like that. Um, and, and so I think it could be really interesting to, to use rivers in that context. Um, but then also there's, there's, different uh, kind of races that might live in rivers or or live in other kinds of uh uh you know waterways uh, are we also including like oceans and stuff is that is that part of waterways or yeah, is that waterways okay. so okay. a waterway is defined as and i checked this uh, oh, okay yeah as any navigable stretch of water ah okay cool so that's why i was like let's mm -hmm. get the like people element into this challenge with right. with that word yeah 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 um and then, of course, you know, with uh, with uh, when they have oceans involved, it's like there's all kinds of uh, cool things you could do with that in a fantasy context. You could have, uh, you know, like living waves, or uh, you know, um, you know, all kinds of fun sea creatures that live down, down, down in the deep. Uh, you know, that uh, no one uh, even has ever seen before, and that kind of thing. So, um, I mean, I think there's all kind of fun stuff you could do with that. Um, but then also, like, you can incorporate it into, like, fantasy industry and, like, you know, you could have rivers that, uh, you know, flow up waterfalls instead of down waterfalls, all kind of stuff like that. I mean, it's like just, I feel like a as this thing that we just know because it's in our real world and they're everywhere, uh, I think it's a fun thing to be able to just take that and twist it in ways that are obviously, well, they're impossible in the real world, but it's fun to think about and, uh, you know, gives you that little extra uh, sort of bit of flavor to world building that, you know, it it's like an easy way to get some of that extra flavor, you know, where it's like, maybe it's, maybe you're not going to really do anything with it, but, you know, hey, the, river the waterfall goes up, it, it flows up, that's cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Absolutely. I can imagine a D and D session like the player. You you just throwing that in there, and the players just get obsessed with it. And they're like, I gotta figure out why does that waterfall flow up? It must be important. They wouldn't have put it in there if it wasn't important. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I also love that you jump right on that fantasy space because I think oh, yeah. you know rivers are are so amazing for so many reasons. Like, um, in my opinion, they're great for sort of showing the health mm -hmm. of a of a settlement. For example, like if the river is 
gray and murky and full of crap mm, i'm looking mm -hmm. at you london then that's <laughs> a really easy way to say okay this place is polluted this is probably a darker setting it's a more dystopian place or or it's more grim dark or you know i've, I've set mood immediately by doing that but if the river runs smooth and crystal mm -hmm. clear and reflects the waters with a prism of sunlight then all of a sudden you've got a completely different place mm -hmm. and they're so often at the center of settlements that mm -hmm. because of course that's what the settlement was built around that it then becomes this real centerpiece of your mood and theme as well mm. yeah and and i think one of the things you could also do is um you can use the contrast of like so for instance if you have like a shadowy realm that you're that you're in uh if you have if you have your your characters uh encounter this pristine clear river then that's a really like sort of stark thing for them and you know uh like a sort of a, a more wondrous thing so, like if you're in this like really uh you know dark and polluted seeming place when you come across that thing that's like oh this is pure and and you know like so that's nice when when you can have uh, uh sort of things like that happen uh in a story or in a, in a game session or something um but uh but yeah i mean i think uh you know there's um there's all kinds of uh, interesting things that you can do when you, uh, you know, sort of imagine new context for whatever world building element. So like, um, you know, e you know, I was talking about like, you know, rivers flowing up a waterfall, but like, you know, you don't have to stop there. You can also, you could have, you could have rivers going through the air if you want. I mean, you know, it's a fantasy world. You can make anything you want happen. Uh, maybe some wizard did something weird back in the day and it made this river, you know, sort of go up into the sky, you know, and, uh, um, or, or maybe there's like one of those floating cities that like, you know, the, the, you know, the land mass is floating in the air and then they have a, a waterfall that comes all the way down and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe water maybe a, a riverway connects two floating cities and and people sail across between them you know i don't you know there's just all kind of fun stuff you could do with it yeah absolutely <clears throat> so um what do you think are the most interesting ways people use rivers and waterways in world building hmm like, do you, uh, yeah. I mean, you work across so many genres, right? Yeah, different yeah. Media types and right. novels and short stories and RPGs. Mm -hmm. So what are the, some of the most memorable examples that you've seen in fiction? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the most memorable things are like when uh, people create like whole new societies uh, that live in water, like in different ways. Um, and I mean, um, so it's it's kind of a universally uh, reviled movie, but like I always like I always felt like Waterworld was really an interesting example of world building. Like I don't know that it really would hold up if you like picked it apart or whatever, but uh, just the like the 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 settlements that like you know grew up into in this world that had become completely flooded. Like that was all really interesting to me, and that's like a uh, uh, an interesting thing to look at if you're trying to build worlds where it's like even if that was not an, a, a successful example of um of, a, of an actual just overall movie uh to most people uh you know you can take lessons from it from the things that it does do well um so uh and i mean i think that's universally true too like in any kind of world building context where you know uh you know you can you can use you can use uh uh, stuff that you don't like as fuel to help you build something that you do like because it's like um like one one famous example is uh outside of rivers and waterways but like uh people who have there have been so many people who have written uh things that are like star trek done right you know because it's like oh they were they were upset about something about the way star trek did whatever and so then okay now they take it to their own hands to do it the right way um you know quote unquote and uh and so but you can do that with anything you, you know you can do it with fantasy worlds i'm sure plenty of people have done it with like you know like oh uh terry brooks uh, i i didn't didn't love sword of Shannara or whatever so i'm gonna go do my own thing i mean he kind of did that with tolkien except well i guess he kind of just rewrote tolkien but anyway um so yeah, but I mean, you, that's, you know, find inspiration where you can, I guess. But... Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I loved about Waterworld, and I, I love that you bring up that example, is that mm -hmm. we often associate, and that's another question, but we often mm -hmm. associate water with, you know, life and the cradle mm -hmm. of civilization and all of these things. And in Water Waterworld, that whole theme was flipped on its head. It was like, mm -hmm. the water is is all around us but if you just if you're just in the sea for too long it will kill you mm -hmm. so i thought that was really interesting where it it took this concept of you know this this thing that is full of life and flipped it and turned it into something that was was very dark in a way mm -hmm. 
yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, that's another thing, you know, when we're talking about themes, it's really significant. I once had this amazing interview with Umberto Eco, and he was saying that um, someone was saying, oh, why, why is this city full of fog? You write about the fog mm -hmm. all the time. Why did you do that? Is mm -hmm. it because you wanted to make it feel creepy? Is it because you wanted to make it feel like this? And he said, no, it's because the fog feels very comforting to me. It feels <laughs> like a cocoon. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to create. And I think that's something really interesting with rivers and waterways as well. So my association with water is, oh, it's it's terribly cold and horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm from the UK, right? So water mm -hmm. is just like gray, murky thing that mm -hmm. starts where the land stops. And mm -hmm. um, it's terribly cold and, and like you don't want to go in it. And mm -hmm. and now I live in Greece where, you know, the water is glistening blue and everybody wants to be by the sea all the time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I, I think there's uh, there's all kinds of ways to uh, um, you know explore fears and stuff as well with that because it's like in terms of I just started thinking about that because you were saying like how well like on the one hand you know there's people who like just really want to be near the water all the time but there's also people who just never want to be near the water because either they had some bad experience with it or just they're they're just afraid of you know even attempting to go in there be, maybe they're claustrophobic or whatever but um, you know. Uh, I mean, I myself don't particularly care for like oceans or rivers or waterways. I don't, I don't want to be in a river or waterway. I get, I get seasick if I'm on a boat. I don't want to be in the water by my, you know, like, you know, so like, uh, but, but so maybe that's naturally why I'm thinking about like fears and stuff. But like, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, cool, like really weird alien type creatures to us, like even in the real world, like if you go down into the sea. Um, and so like when you then extend that to fantasy world, it's like, okay, well, there's all kinds of great stuff. And I mean, even if you just look in the, like the D&D monster manual or whatever, it's like, there's so many cool underwater monsters. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and and yeah, I'm actually, I'm in a, a, a Ghost of Salt Marsh uh, game right now. So like, obviously a lot of that is uh, all water-based, you know, like we're basically pirates and then we're fighting Salgan and uh, going in <clears throat> under, we're underwater a lot of the time. So, um, but uh, yeah, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, I think it's interesting from, uh, from a, like a, a a D&D perspective uh, or, you know, role playing game perspective, because it's like it, it, when you put it when you put the players into such a completely different context as underwater <clears throat> with all these additional rules and everything that have to be applied because you're underwater, uh, it, it makes it for a really interesting uh, sort of uh, dynamic, um, like because it's like it's put it's putting you into this different situation that like you know okay well you're you're really uh uh able when you're on land and you're comfortable and you're and you're used to what you're you know you're fighting in this context you're used to and then when you throw people into water it's like okay well now it's a completely different game and you're fighting something that lives in water you know so um you know it's uh i think that's fun of yeah, course I'm, I'm playing a moon druid so i just turn into something that can fight you know live in water so i did um i did a promotional game for the the D D channel with uh, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Mm -hmm. And um, the GM that we had, Guy the Great GM, for those in the know, um, created his own homebrew races because he wanted to add a little bit of his own spin and show mm -hmm. sort of the breadth of the setting that's that's possible, not just what's mm -hmm. written. Um, and so we all played aquatic races that were mm -hmm largely homebrewed and we mm. had exactly the same problem in reverse what mm. do you do if you're a mermaid and you're on land mm. now mm -hmm. i was lobbying for a battle wheelbarrow and i did not get one mm -hmm. uh which is a great shame it was gonna have mm. i was gonna be like boudicca with one wheel gonna be amazing but apparently that was not that was not the thing so i ended up with a magical object and that was a quick way to solve that problem but it does, if you do have mm -hmm. aquatic species, it does bring up really interesting questions. Mm -hmm. How does this work? What changes do people make? Because essentially they have a disability when they are mm -hmm. out of their element. And that is mm -hmm. a really interesting thing to explore. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in our game, we have uh, we have a, a sea elf and a triton. And so like we have a fair number of people who are, you know, aquatic. But um one of the things that I thought has been interesting that's come up is like, okay, well, when we start talking about like books and things, and it's like, oh, wait so wait do you, do you all have books down there you know like and it's like well how, how do they have books i mean how do they how do they learn all the things that like this guy knows or whatever you know and so um is it all oral storytelling and uh you know because i mean they can talk to each other underwater but can they have books i i don't know i mean it, it is a magical world so sure i guess but uh it's just like how does that work exactly it's one of those uh it's one of those gaps in world building that like if you drill into it too much like in like the way D D has it presented or with it the way the module has it presented it's like well 
I don't know. Let's just move on. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it can lead to what I like to call world builders disease, which is yeah. where you just end up obsessing over small things that are not really taking you forward and adding you to the plot. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I I vote kelp books that disintegrate <laughs> water. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. I I think limitations make for really interesting stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> so we actually have a question that's coming from Dazzling Cat, which is very interesting. What are the most essential parts of a waterway that every waterway must have? Oh, um, hmm. Well, I'm afraid I don't have enough, like, like scientific knowledge to really answer that question. Like, uh, I, I've been amused on Reddit, like uh, seeing people talking about maps and like the rivers on maps. And there was this whole like river gate thing where it was like, oh, like the rivers are going the wrong way or whatever. And like, I was trying to follow it. I really was trying to understand what they were talking about. And I just never really did understand it. So uh, I'm not the right person to ask about that particular thing. Like if you got something wrong it, about how a waterway flows or something in a, like a novel or or an uh, adventure or something, I, I, I have to admit, I probably would not notice. Um, so that's, that's not the sort of editor that I am where I'm gonna catch that kind of thing. But, um, you know, uh, ideally I would be, I would, I would uh, be able to like Google around or like find, find some, some, something about the way it's presented. Like, is that how it works? Let me go check. And, but as far as being able to advise off the top of my head, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so it's interesting because I presented a lot of these kind of like all the cartographers say um, mm -hmm. the mono mountain is another one. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. have a single mountain in a plane. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, or, or rivers that split. Rivers should never mm -hmm. split. Mm -hmm. They should only join, according to the cartographers. But mm -hmm. I asked my sister, who is a geologist, and she mm -hmm. said, rivers split. Mm -hmm. Here are five examples. You mm -hmm. can have a mono mountain. Often they're extinct volcanoes. So mm -hmm. I think it's very it's very good to be careful of what the cartographers yeah. say because in general they may be right, but there are also a lot of really interesting mm -hmm. examples where in fact this weird cool thing does happen mm -hmm. and yeah. this weird cool thing can happen in your world. Mm -hmm. So that's always my answer to those things. Like make yeah. it make it work for your story. Yeah. And honestly, that would be how I answer that question. The mm -hmm. thing that the essential part of the waterway must have is it must serve the purpose that it's supposed to be serving in your story. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, too, it's like, uh, you know, uh, if you are writing in a fantasy world, it's like, it doesn't matter if, if rivers don't split in the real world or not, you know, because if you want them to split in a fantasy world, go ahead, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the yeah, the rivers should just or whatever way to just do what you needed to do in the story. And, um, you know, and then I think, you know, just, just have to be consistent with it. And uh, once you, once you establish the parameters for what it, how it behaves and, and, and all that, like it, it should stay consistent unless there's some sort of external force causing it to do something else like magic or whatever. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's the only thing. Um, uh, and yeah, just like, you know, I think it should have a purpose, like, you know, don't just have a waterway because you feel like, you know, like, uh, like, oh, well, every town should have a waterway. It's like, well, I mean, should it in this case, like not everyone does. So like, you know, if it is essential to your town, then yeah, put it in there, but don't feel like it has to be there just because a lot of towns do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I would say, we say waterway, but it doesn't even have to have water. If mm, your people mm. can navigate lava flows, mm -hmm. build lava flows. It's awesome. Why? Mm -hmm. Why on earth not? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if if that works in your world, if that's something, if that's a story you want to tell or a D and D game you want to play, mm -hmm. then do it. Give everybody rubber boots and mm -hmm. asbestos boots, maybe asbestos mm -hmm. boots. Give everybody asbestos boots. <laughs> so, um, any favorite real world examples of cool rivers or waterways? Uh, I mean, New Orleans is basically like a ridiculous uh, fantasy map if you look at it. I, I, I don't know if you guys had seen uh, uh, James Sutter, who's one of the um, you know creators of Pathfinder. He he like did a whole Twitter thread uh, <laughs> like looking at New Orleans as a map and thinking like if if this was a fantasy map like it would never fly like people would be like wait wait what like there's this giant bridge that goes across this enormous lake that's ridiculous and uh and then just like just the, all the geography of it um so i mean yeah new orleans stands out as like okay well <laughs> i mean that's amazing that 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 actually exists um but uh but yeah that's that's what comes to mind for me 
I love that. I played a vampire game in New Orleans, in oh. New Orleans, and we did indeed spend a lot of time at the map going, "This place is awesome and yeah, weird yeah. and awesome." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then biting people because it was a vampire <laughs> game, and that's what you right. do. <laughs> right. Oh man, um, how do you handle water-based travel? Like sailing, for example, either in stories or in RPGs. How can mm -hmm. you make it interesting? How can mm -hmm. you manage that sort of downtime space? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, in, uh, I mean, I guess it's going to be pretty different in storytelling versus role playing game, just because like in storytelling, you can you can just skip ahead if, if, if there's long stretches of boredom or whatever. But um, but I mean, there's lots of uh, complications that can happen. So I mean, I think, you know, you know, you can have them encounter other ships, you can have them encounter uh, bad weather, you know, they can, you know, uh, have uh, mutinies on board, you can have um, them run out of supplies. I mean, because it's like, because because it's so restricted in terms of like, what's available to them. And so like any kind of um, loss is like really uh, felt like sort of tenfold, like compared to like, you know, if you just lost something from in your house, you know, it's like, you can go get something else, but they're stuck on the sea for however many, you know, more months or whatever. Um, so there's that, um, but and then in role playing games, obviously there's there's going to be you know rules in in your game for how long it takes to get from point A to point B when you're on 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 a boat or whatever. But um, again, it's like you know I think the fun part of of that in a role playing game is to you know well don't just put your people on a ship have some kind of aquatic monster attack this ship and you know they have to defend it and because then again that's a that's a different situation that uh, you know even if you're not jumping in the water and fighting it on its own turf like you know you have to fight a monster from the ship or you have to repel invaders and, and that kind of thing and i think that's fun um it also gives you the opportunity to like bust out some spells that you don't necessarily normally use like like control water or like tidal wave or something and like you know just like really mess with uh these ocean dwelling uh, creatures uh day you know um but uh yeah i mean i think um otherwise uh you know i i I think you just skip over any boring parts, you know, I mean, even, even in a role-playing game, it's like, you know, you don't have to account for every second of every day. And it's like, uh, if it, if it's uh, just like two days of, of travel where nothing happens, it's like, okay, well, now we're back in town, <laughs> you know, nothing happened. Uh, you have a long rest, you have two long rests, you know, do, did, did anybody want to do anything in, in the, in the intervening time? No. Okay. We're back in town, you know? So uh, yeah, I think you just a lead, whatever, um, you know, is boring <laughs> just and so i guess that's that's it's the same actually for both uh fiction and, and role-playing games in that case yeah. it's just that role-playing no games story gives you more and there's roles. no conflict yeah yeah move on. yeah 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 we got a great question that came in from marquise de Degue, uh, i think uh who asks what of your what are your favorite or some interesting methods for moving goods and items along waterways hmm hmm uh yeah, I mean, I don't have anything uh, that comes to mind that's like too, uh, you know, unique or anything. But I mean, it's like, you know, boats and barges and things. But um, I mean, again, this is somewhere where you can let your imagination run wild and like, you know, uh, maybe you you have maybe there's a whole like sort of uh, breed of like sort of livestock that that just sort of swims up and down like riverways, um, like, you know, maybe like something like a uh, like a like a manatee or like or like something bigger than that like you know that you can uh strap stuff to and like and like they just swim up and down a place or whatever so i mean like you know i don't know there's things like that um but uh and then of course you know you have in a, in a world where there's magic you could have magic uh or um as uh you know uh you have a magical industry and everything like you know you have artificers and that kind of thing you could you know they could have built magical contraptions that can go up and down the rivers um maybe they're powered maybe they're powered by hydroelectric power or something you know and so um i don't know i mean there's there's all kind of things but um in terms of like actually thinking of examples i can't really think of anything offhand that uh, comes to mind um but yeah i mean i think it's a good idea good thing to think about because uh, it could, you know, th that's a, that sounds like another fun way to add some, you know, flavor to your to your world building. Uh, so. um, I would like to add an interesting little anecdote. Mm -hmm. So Shakespeare built the Globe Theatre. Um, there was some legal hanky panky about the land that the theatre was built on. So in the dead of night, they dismantled hmm. the theatre hmm. and they took it across the river. 
it was it was frozen the river at the time. Mm-hmm. And they literally they broke the theatre apart, carried it across the river in the middle of the night mm. on a balls freezing, freezing time. And uh, reconstructed the theatre on the other side of the river. <laughs> so um, these are the kinds of stories and legends that you can create. Mm, you know, mm-hmm. and, and rivers change state. If a river gets really clogged during the mm-hmm. um, during a period where of autumn, for example, where all the trees are deciduous. If a winter, if a river swells its banks or becomes very very small at certain mm-hmm. parts of year, or if a river freezes over, you will get different kinds of transport and different kinds of ways of using the river if the river changes, if it's seasonal. So I think that's something not to not to forget as well when we're thinking about the way people use rivers, is mm-hmm. that rivers are, of course, not static, but not even their beds are static. Mm-hmm. Like, And not even the volume of water that comes through is static. So this is something that you can really play with a lot. Like, oh, in, the, in this period of time, we do this. And in that period of time, we treat it like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's also uh, opportunities for um, so, sort of tension when you use rivers as sort of like a, a, an impediment where like, you know, okay, well, if the river is particularly deep or wide, you know, uh, you can have, you know, sort of bandits corner uh, characters so that, you know, they use the terrain to sort of, uh, it, you know, s- set up an ambush or something. Um, or or there's cases like in, um, like in Wheel of Time when they're, um, when they're fleeing from the Trollocs in the, in the first book and uh, Moraine uh, sort of leads them across that uh, river or lake. I'm not sure what it was, but it was, it was some, you know, it was a, bo- a, a a sort of moderate sized body of water that had a barge and, you know, they had to, uh, you know, the Trollocs, like vampires I was mentioning, I guess, don't want to cross running water. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's another example of where, like, you, you know, you can work the, the existence of, of this waterway into a, into a setting in a way that, uh, you know, sort of adds into the tension and the conflict that's happening. I love that. I love that so much. And I think rivers have so much potential for that. Um, also, the way they use just geopolitical boundaries or mm-hmm. um, there's this amazing uh, incident that happened during a hurricane where the whole river went bloop <laughs> and moved. So now <laughs> there is a bridge in South America somewhere <laughs> next to a river. <laughs> because mm. the whole riverbed moved. Now, mm-hmm. if that river happened to be a geopolitical border, what the hell do you do then? Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's so interesting. Or if somebody yeah. upriver stops the water flowing down. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you can really use it um, tactically to like, yeah. cut people off downstream, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's actually a really interesting idea in terms of uh, things that you can do like in a fantasy setting comp- in particular, because when you have magic and all kinds of uh, you know, crazy impossible things that would, or things that would be impossible in the real world. Like, yeah, you could just have like some evil tyrant just cut off that riverway. Uh, and so it's like, oh, everybody south of here? Well, too bad for you. I know you survive on that river, but you, I guess you better, uh, uh, you know, yeah. pay me my due or whatever, <laughs> you know, because I'm evil. Uh, I love but, that. Yeah. I can just say it as like, nice river there. Shame yeah. if someone were to gather yeah, yeah. 30 mages and turn it into a lake. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, totally. And and there's so much like rivers give dyna- dynamism to the landscape. Like there's so mm-hmm. much that you can you can do with them that's sort of interesting and tactical. That's why we ran the challenge in the first place. I'm obsessed mm-hmm. with rivers. I think they're really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> let's ask one final question from the chat before we move on to our second topic of the evening. This to- this question is any tips for world building river piracy? I am obsessed <laughs> with river pirates. I keep talking <laughs> about them. We did a whole video about how cool rivers are. I would shout about river pirates. So, John, what's your opinion on river pirates and making them awesome? Well, I mean, it just seems like they're already awesome. I mean, just uh, is I mean, is there anything in particular you need to do besides just make river pirates be there? Like, I mean, that sounds awesome. Um, you know, uh, uh, actually, uh, so uh, I, don't, I guess it's probably in the module, but like when I played uh, Princes of the Apocalypse, uh, there was a there was a case where there was sort of river pirates, and it was like, and it was it was very memorable. I have to say, it was my first encounter with river pirates in D and D. I think, but um, but yeah, that uh, um, thinking about having that like as a as just like a a constant thing that's all up and down rivers that actually sounds really awesome. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess it depends. Uh, you know, you have to have uh, rivers of a certain width and depth and everything so that it can accommodate these things without, and like, you know, you have to, cause you know, pirates have to be able to like ambush you. Like, you know, they can't just like 
you can't see them all the time and then like uh so i guess i don't know maybe maybe you have maybe you have some invisible sea uh river pirates or you have uh, river pirates that are uh you know under the they they they're mostly under the water and they they emerge uh to to do their piracy uh so i mean i don't know i guess that's that's those are a couple ways you can can make it even more awesome than they just inherently are but uh just river pirates just being yeah. awesome yeah. i think yeah like you say little tributaries are another useful thing mm -hmm. for that because it's places that you can lurk mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. on, and good bends and this kind of thing mm -hmm. like again if if i'm thinking like a dm if i'm mm -hmm. thinking about you know half cover and advantage to hiding and sneaking mm -hmm. and this kind of thing that's the kind of things i'd be thinking about i think mm -hmm. Uh, and there's also like things like uh, like fog and um, and other kind of uh, things that like you know might provide cover you know ambush spots and that that, that kind of thing. So, I mean, if you wanted to, you could even go so far as to give them. I mean, you know, like harbor chains that protect oh, yeah. the harbor. Yeah, yeah, they can yeah. like erect chains on either side of the river. Like, yeah. a, you can go quite far with this if you wanted to. I right. would say the most important thing with your river pirates: give them a purpose, mm -hmm. make them want something, mm -hmm. preferably something slightly more awesome than your stuff yeah uh, like give them give them a, a dream or a motivation or a cult or something mm -hmm, cool mm -hmm. that that gives them that like something extra than just like i covered things that don't belong to me right right uh yeah and there's also like uh river pirates could even potentially not be actual like uh pirates who have a ship that are on the river like they could be they could be land-based and like they could converge on from both sides uh on ships and maybe they have magic that can like you know like siphon this the wind out of the sails to, of whatever ship is on the river and uh you know yeah, uh, it'll, make it'll it dead in the water yeah, yeah absolutely oh i love that i love that river pirates <laughs> there you are <laughs> um that is all we have time for today so john thank you so much for coming to join us today Oh, thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Alrighty then. In that case, I would like to invite you to grab your hammer and go world build. <laughs> See you soon, Beans. Bye.